In this video, we're going to talk to you today about the Quaker testimonies. What do we mean by Quaker testimonies historically? How has our concept of them changed to today? We're also going to talk about Quaker witness. We're going to talk about those things that make Quakers a peculiar people. We're going to talk about this concept of heterotopia and the notion of the hedge. Okay, so when dealing with testimony, it's actually a good thing to do to kind of take a step back, calm down, and just remember what the word means. Now, testimony has taken on kind of uh, a very important role, especially among liberal friends in North America, although it's possible that other friends elsewhere have also taken the testimonies to become very important. I know that in my tradition, which is the tradition of liberal friends in North America, in the United States of America particularly, that the testimonies have become uh, a huge part of what being a friend is. Some folks go even so far to say it's, that's what friends believe in. And so part of the reason that comes about, I believe, is because so often the, the friend's path is that apophatic path, right? The via negativa, which some folks call kind of the dark path, which is the stripping away and saying, it's not this, this is not of God, this is not of God, this is not of God, that what you're left with is a faith that continues to say what it's not. And some people say, oh, I need to know what it is. And they have taken the testimony sometimes to, as a stand-in for um, what friends are or what friends believe. And I think that does a disservice to the original understanding, as I understand it, of what the testimonies were. And so to kind of get at the touchstone or the taproot of that understanding of testimony, it's a good thing to do to start with the word testimony. Testimony is obviously related to this word testify. And a good way to think about that is to, if I ask you to think about what testifying looks like, many folks would think about a courtroom situation. And when you're called to testify, what you're called to do is to speak the facts of the situation as you, as you, whoa, as you have perceived them. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Now, this idea of testifying in a court situation is also very applicable to the situation of a testimony as early friends would have understood it. So, what they're doing is not saying what they believe that they should do to be a Quaker, but they are testifying that the Spirit of God in their lives has revealed something to them, has opened a truth to them, has made them realize something, and that is something that they must do. So. One of the most famous testimonies is the peace testimony. And many folks say it's the peace testimony that helps us remember to be nonviolent or that helps us live peaceful lives. And in fact, I would say we need to take a look before that because it's not the testimony that does that. The testimony itself doesn't have the power in it. The testimony is simply a testi testimony, testament, a testification to the fact that there's this inward movement of the spirit which our community at one point in time found to be true. And actually in the language of the words that we often say are the peace testimony, that George Fox wrote to Charles II, we can hear some of the, the beginnings of that language being to take place. So to really work with that, I'd like to share uh, some of the language from that letter that was written to King Charles II by George Fox. And it's included in many versions of faith and practice for lots of different yearly meetings. This one happens to be the uh, Pacific Yearly Meeting Faith and Practice. Uh, I don't know what edition it is or what year, 2001, but I think it's found in most faith and practices. And that's the kind of this central uh, document for most yearly meetings. Sometimes they're called a book of discipline. If you're connected to a monthly meeting, if you ask someone for faith and practice, you can probably find one. Okay, so 1660, um, it's George Fox, and this is an excerpt from his letter to Charles II. We utterly deny all outward wars and strife and fightings with outward weapons for any end or on any pretense whatsoever. And this is our testimony to the whole world. The Spirit of Christ, which leads us into all truth, will never move us to fight and war against any man with outward weapons, neither for the kingdom of Christ nor for kingdoms of this world. So what he's articulating is a testimony. 
that the Spirit of Christ, which leads us all into truth, has revealed to him and to those gathered around him in fellowship of brotherhood and sisterhood that war will not be something that they are driven to out of that power of truth. Now they might be driven to war out of uh, fights with kingdoms for kingdoms of the world, but the kingdom of truth, the peaceable kingdom, will never lead them into outward wars, strife and fightings with outward weapons. So it's a testimony that somewhere in their heart they believe that they had come to a truth and that truth had been tested in their community and as a body, as a gathered group, they had become clear, okay, they had reached clearness that it was true for them that they would not be led into violence, they would not be led into war. And so they testified to the reality of that inward truth and as a result, they wrote this, Fox wrote this letter to Charles II. So looking at this, I think it's important to understand that the testimonies, which we often say in themselves have some power to help us do something, are like signposts. And they are signposts that point to an inward experience, an inward revelation, an inward opening, an inward understanding or shift in perception that leads us to living into a new kind of world, a world that we can imagine that's more just and more like the kingdom of God. We wanted to share some other language with you, also from Pacific Yearly Meetings 2001 edition of the Faith and Practice. It's how they describe testimonies for friends in that yearly meeting, and I think it's helpful for friends uh, everywhere. On page 38 it says, Testimonies bear witness to the truth as friends and community perceive it. Truth known through relationship with God. Testimonies are expressions of lives turned toward the light, outward expressions that reflect the inward experience of divine guidance. Outward expressions that reflect the inward experience of divine guidance. There is no single list of testimonies, and we'll get back to that. To understand the role of testimonies in friends' history and spiritual practice, it is first important to understand to understand their essential oneness. We want to lift up one testimony in particular, and that's the testimony of integrity. And I'm going to read just a little bit of the language on, um, from Pacific Yearly Meetings Faith and Practice on integrity. It starts with the quote um, that's memorialized on George Fox's tombstone, and it's, Let your lives speak. The testimony of integrity calls us to wholeness. It is the whole of life open to truth. When lives are centered in the spirit, beliefs and actions are congruent. Words are dependable. As we achieve wholeness in ourselves, we are better able to heal the conflict and fragmentation in our communities and in the world. The testimony of integrity for friends is very much connected to this concept, as friends see it, of witness. Witness is the ways in which our lives speak to the truth that we know. But unlike a testimony, a witness may be an action carried by a single individual, it may be a one-time event, it may be a, an ongoing concern that a person carries. I may have a witness to fair trade coffee and um, carry that witness wherever I go, educating people in my community and in my family, in my meeting, about the importance of relationships of justice and commerce in the trade of coffee. Our first motion is love, greeting one another and becoming friends. Our experience of the Spirit is not just grandeur and glory and bursting forth from still small places, we also meet the Spirit in our shortcomings and our failings. I had to notice that this power was present even in and around my fears, tragedies, incompetence, and hard times. Life, love, and truth are always present. My brokenness was a gift wherein I can see beyond my own ego to the world as it is. I was not called to be God, but to be my perfect part of Spirit's perfect whole. This speaks to our 
testimony of integrity in that it's not just the perfect polished parts that we are showing the world, but it's our broken spaces. Sometimes our ministry comes from our tenderest places, the wounded places that can speak to the wounded places in the world. And it's that recognition that it is the wholeness of us as people before God that um, we bring in service and witness to the truth that we're given that is united in this testimony of integrity. So it's interesting because today, especially to contemporary friends, again, at least in liberal uh, North American meetings, the focus on testimonies has become um, a very central one. And I, and I want to draw us back to understand it in perspective. There's nothing kind of wrong or right about it. It's simply the case that we are focused on the testimony. But I also want to draw us into a historical perspective wherein we consider that origin again. Because now we have a pattern set of testimonies that are usually of a certain length and there's, there's something that's often taught, especially in first day schools, called the spices. So S is um, for spirituality and, and then P is for peace and I is for integrity, C is for community, E is for equality, and sometimes there's an S on the end for stewardship. So the spices are our testimonies, and they stand for what we believe in. And I, again, like I said, I think that's somewhat dangerous. And we need to zoom back because the testimonies, which now feel somewhat codified, were not always the case. Early on, we have examples of testimonies, and there were lots of them. There were testimonies, um, and they're often done in the negative. Friends often do not, dot, dot, dot. There is testimonies against eating mincemeat pies because um, the tradition among early uh, folks in England was to trim the mincemeat pies with the, the, the dough shape of an angel and friends thought that was idolatrous and so there was a testimony against mincemeat pies. Later on there was a testimony against wearing um, lace, a testimony against owning piano. So there were so many kinds of testimonies. So the fact that we've ended up today with this sense of a codified structure of what friends believe or what friends can testify to is almost a mistake. Now, as far as I know and have heard, it comes back to the writing of Howard Brinton. And what I want to show you is a diagram from one of his books. Now, in the diagram, he's done something, and what he's talking about is the corporate meeting for worship and kind of what happens there, but as a result of it, it's part of this codification process. So take a look at this image. Now what you'll see on the top is the light. And the light is again synonymous with the seed of Christ or the inner teacher or the inward guide. Uh, so all of those things are there at the top. And it's coming down and that information or the light is entering into the corporate body at worship. Not an individual who's having a feeling or a good idea, but a corporate body, particularly in a meeting for worship with a concern for business. They're trying to do some discernment. And then at the side, there are these like side arrows. And what they're saying is, we are understanding this inspiration, this revelation from the light, but it's also being tempered with reason on the one side. And on the other side, uh, what we also see is authority. So we have this human sense of authority and reason, but it's also being combined, forged together with this insight and revelation. And as a result, what are some of the outward um, kind of products of that? Well, here's this list. Boom, 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 boom. Now, that list, which has to do with corporate discernment and a deciding and a realization that something is true for us as determined from the light or from the spirit of the inward teacher or, you know, wherever it comes from, has now, down the road some years, often become what people refer to as the Quaker testimonies. So hopefully as part of this video, we understand that those testimonies aren't wrong. It's not as if they're not testimonies. They certainly are, but we're not limited to what we know today. And in fact, there used to be a wide range of testimonies. And the important part of the testimony is this piece of integrity. What can you speak to that is part of your own idea of integrity? What do you have to do to be right with yourself? You know, I often think about the, the story uh, of Martin Luther. And when he was on trial uh, for having written these theses, you know, the 95 theses, his arguments against the church, he was given the opportunity to stand down and potentially avoid some scathing repercussions. And what he said at that point in time was, I, here I stand, I can do no else. And sometimes that's what the testimony of integrity is. I have to do this. I must do this. 
that I can do no else doesn't mean that you have to do this. And one of the things that we wanted to lift up is that sometimes friends see the testimonies. They, friends who are new to meetings especially, might see the testimonies as a common creed that's held by a meeting. And I have even heard cases where friends feel that they need to be able to say, I can believe in all of the testimonies of Quakers and that they need to do this before they apply for membership or deepen their relationship with the community and that they have even held up application for membership deepening relationship with the community becoming part of spiritual seeking because they're just not easy with the peace testimony they're not sure if they could be nonviolent and um, we think that this is taking the testimonies as a set of rules and a creed which is not the spirit in which they're held. They are the truth that friends have lived into by settling into that life and power of Christ. And it's that sinking into the life and power of the seed that is the work we do together in our meetings. And then truth is revealed. So our advice, if we can give that, is that if there is a friend who's not so sure about the testimony of simplicity or likes the testimony of simplicity but is having a hard time simplifying their life, the answer is to not simply write it off but to then go back to the community and say, I am struggling with this, friends. What is this thing? I'm not sure if it's true for me. And it's that experience of truth, it's that experience of trying to discern with a gathered body and community what it is that is true, to what degree it is true, and to what degree you're being called to live into it, that the process and worship and connection of a community is there for. So the testimonies are yet another opportunity for us to gain uh, knowledge of each other in that which is eternal, to worship together, and to explore, to be seekers of what more truth might be revealed. Maybe that conversation is incredibly important to the deepening of our faith life. And maybe someday around the corner it will lead to us understanding and being at ease with the, um, with the testimony of simplicity. But it's not about that end goal. It's about being in integrity with the process continuing to let truth be revealed in that continuing revelation that was open to Fox and letting your life speak as much as you are able for where you stand. We need to, as communities, meet each person where they are, not demanding that they change, but inviting them to live into greater wholeness and greater integrity so that their lives can be more joyful and they don't have to carry around the baggage of doing things that they don't really want to be doing in their heart of hearts. So within this context of understanding the Quaker testimonies and, and what Quaker witness is and how it shows out in people's lives and letting your life speak, we wanted to share some of the comments that we received this week on our survey on the internet. And a reminder that if folks are interested in seeing other videos in the series, other results of the surveys, and taking some of those surveys, which we will continue to update, you can go to this website here, click on there, and scroll down to the bottom, and there's all sorts of resources available. And from this week, there are a couple things we want to share. The first I would share is a response to the question, what are the Quaker testimonies? And we felt like this was another great way of articulating that. And this is from Nate Swift of Medford Friends and Northwest Yearly Meeting. And Nate says, the Quaker testimonies are the expressions of the experience shared by friends of basic ways in which living in the light will show in our lives. They are not like doctrines imposed from without but what understanding each visual individual will come to about conducting life in the light when contemplating how to implement the love that we share. For that reason, each person will have a personal understanding of each testimony, but also for that reason, testimony should serve as a basis for self-examination. So Nate, for Nate, it's much more of a personalized thing. Another one that we wanted to share around that query around what are the testimonies uh, is from Jay Thatcher of Corvallis Friends Meeting, also North Pacific Yearly Meeting. The question was, what are the Quaker testimonies? And the answer that Jay had was that friends have found that a relationship with God has led different Quakers to similar expressions in our lives of faith and truth that's offered us. The way that we live testifies to our relationship with God. Friends have found that they're called out of participation in wars and into a life that treats all people evenly. That manner of life is simple, and all aspects are considered and held up into the light. This leaves minimal impediments into that relationship with Christ. 
The life found in the community of a friends meeting can help us in responding faithfully to our calling of truth in our hearts. The testimony of our lives is described in different ways, but the importance of having a life that reflects our experience of God remains. I really like that last piece. The testimony of our lives is described in different ways, and I would add, and witnessed to in different ways. But the importance of having a life that reflects our experience of God remains. That is, when there are changes in the inward landscape, inward spiritual revelations, it's not enough to just profess them. They also then to have to transform our outward experience. There has to be a conversion of habits so that our outward life, the things we do in the world and the life we live, is shifted and transformed by the inward realization that we've had that we need to do something different. I'd like to share one more quote, and it's to a different query before closing out with this idea of a hedge and heterotopia. And the query was this, historically, friends distinguish themselves as a peculiar people, refusing hat honor and titles and not taking oaths and lifting up the equality of women and natives. In what ways do you see that friends today have practices that set them apart from the crowd? And the answer we want to share is from a Lou Harper of Rochester Monthly Meeting in New York Yearly Meeting. And Lou says, being in the world but not of it was how early friends would have named it. What's disturbing is the way in which some of these distinctives that started as testimonies hardened into rules and lost power thereby. Early on, Fox says that the hedge, which is a term later used for the boundaries for the behavior of these peculiarities, was the power of God. The hedge is the power of God. However, by early into the second generation, William Penn, for example, friends were using the term hedge as a boundary that defined groupness, that kept some in and others out. We see this in the interactions that developed during the first schisms, the first splits among Quakerism that formed different sects. I don't believe we have any true distinctives now, and I'm not sure we should try for it. When we rest in the power of God, our individual and corporate behavior may once again develop in ways that set us apart from the world. But the goal should in fact not be for those behaviors, oh, but the goal should be, in fact, for those behaviors to speak so strongly that they will bring everyone into unity, not set up walls or hedges between people. And so this idea that Lou has brought up around the hedge is how we want to really kind of close. Because some of the testimonies, for example, uh, wearing the plain dress or not taking a hat off or using the speech thee and thou, um, treating women equally. Some of these things which became peculiar things, friends dressed a certain way and spoke a certain way, they started as an inward testimony that they felt compelled to do for equality or for simplicity. But when they became a rigid rule that you had to follow, Lou suggests they lost their power. When you were told you had to do something, rather than experiencing something inwardly and conforming your life to the inward experience, they began to fall away and they began to lose their spiritual power. And these things are important. They were called hedges and some friends were counseled to keep up the hedges to make sure that you remembered you were not part of those other people. And so this is an interesting part of the early development of friends. It very much ties into the idea of testimony witness. And while it's perhaps not such a part of our modern day understanding, it's useful to kind of understand early friends and how they thought about themselves in reaction to the world outside of their meeting. And then to maybe take up some ideas to close off the video about how friends might think about that today. To close, we want to introduce one more concept that requires a diagram. This concept is heterotopia. In this diagram, you can see that friends, um, Quakers are in the top corner, and in the top corner, they are receiving direct information from the divine, direct revelation from the divine. The kingdom is come and is coming. They are divided from the rest of the world by the fact that they are building this kingdom of God here on earth. And in so doing, they are also working on mending the world. The um, concept of heterotopia, hetero meaning different, means building a different society inside the world that exists.
early friends wouldn't have spoken this way about their relationship with the rest of the world. In fact, we've borrowed this diagram and this concept from Pink Dandelion's book, The Liturgies of Quakerism, and he gets it from a study by Pilgrim. But we feel the concept is useful to think about the ways in which Quakers, and early friends in particular, living into the uh, truth that they knew lived into a different kind of world and that different kind of world requires community. Um, they were living into experiments, into socio new sociological realities that um, meant that they lived together in different ways and that living together in different ways was a witness to the rest of the world. So to finish and to kind of point the way towards what we think might kind of be future uh, glimpses of what's going on in the religious society, it's important to acknowledge some of the problems that some folks have with this diagram. So let's look at it again. Now that line that separates the Quakers from the world is rigid. It's a very firm thing that separates folk. And in fact, the vision of the Quakers here is of a chosen people. They are the elect few who understand God's will. And early friends, in fact, did think that. It's important for us to acknowledge the history of the tradition. Now, the arrow which goes from friends into the world, many feel is very domineering and they're uncomfortable with the diagram because of something like that. And so rather than throw the whole thing away and say that anyone can believe everyone, any, anyone can believe whatever they want, and uh, nothing really matters, there's no truth, and you know, God is just this hazy image anyway, one of the images we would like to invite friends to consider is this one. A couple things to notice here are that that line is much more permeable. It's a little wavy, there's some gaps in it. So people can get in and out without having to hop over that bush and worry about getting the thorn stuck in their side. Another thing to consider is that the arrow, which went from the Quakers out into the world, shining their truth, is in fact in the other direction. And what I would encourage folks to consider is that that is the sign of invitation as opposed to colony. So rather than going out into the world and spreading their truth other places, Folks invite people into their meetings and say, truth has revealed some powerful things here, and it makes us joyful. So that image then is another image of the gospel, the good news. If friends are really taking their, their seeking seriously and they are revealing it to each other and they are discovering new things about the world and things that they want to testify to because it, it's, it's exciting them from the inside, then let's open our doors and invite people into our meetings and say, we are on fire with the Spirit and we are joyful and we want you to come share food with us. We want you to share fellowship with us. Our doors are open, our arms are open. And that kind of activity, inviting people in, seems to be more in sync with the, the world we are living into of polycentrism, of postmodernism, of globalization, rather than us having a monopoly and God speaking directly to our ear and only to our ear and us being forced to go out into the world and speak the fiery brimstone of the truth, we can hold on to much of the riches of our heritage and still understand that prophetic tradition of wisdom from the divine directly unmediated to us. And then instead of trying to tell other people that our truth is the truth we understand, we can still profess our truth and open the doors and say to other people, we have this thing that we understand to be true. You know, how does it sound to you? And that invitational gesture of drawing in, that arrow that is not pointing out into the world to fix and mend it, but is inviting the world into a more joyful place that people have found as a result of seeking each other and seeking to live into the kingdom of God, that perhaps might be the model that we need to be headed towards in terms of the relationship between the religious society of friends, testimonies and witness in the years to come. Thank you.